Okay. So our call to worship is from Luke 1, 78 to 79. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. Our first hymn is Living for Jesus. We can stand together and worship our Lord as we sing the words to this song.
One of my favorite songs, beautiful. No power of hell or scheme of man can ever talk to you. So now we have our doxology and our prayer over our ties and offerings. Father God, accept these tithes and offerings 
as worship back to you to further your kingdom. Bless our service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's start with our praise time first. I'm just going to... This morning's scripture is taken from Matthew 6, 6 and Matthew 14, 23. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. The evening came. And he was there alone. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you're placed in the forefront and I'm in the back. Your will be done. And guide me as I bring your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've entitled this sermon, Spending Time Alone with God, a much necessary thing that we do daily as Christians, seek that time out from this crazy busy world uh, to pray, to seek God's will, his guidance, and just that relationship building with God. And we've just finished this series on the Lord's Prayer, and we've learned many important things about this prayer. We've learned that we have a loving and we have a kind almighty father to whom we offer our praise and our thankfulness. He attends to our needs and he assists us daily. He's concerned for our well-being and desires that we work together in love and unity as a corporate entity called the church. We learn that God also cares calls us to be aware of the needs of others and sometimes calls us to be leaders in social justice and that it's not just about us. So today these two scriptures teach us that finding this time alone with God is also essential. God desires that time with us away from the day's motion. We live in a distracting world with cell phones and apps and video games and chatter, alarms and phone calls. Sometimes wonder if we like this crazy busyness. I know people who thrive on having the television or music running in the background as they work. Sometimes myself, I can accomplish a lot with a bit of music in the background. But I, too, need that quiet time to recharge my batteries. When I read the scriptures, I see Jesus with many people in that heat of the Middle Eastern sun. All day, every day, walking and talking and teaching and healing. But these two scriptures show us a little bit of a different picture. Jesus left the crowd. He went by himself to pray and to be alone with his father. I can only imagine how tired he must have been after those long days doing all that work, all that walking. There were no mopeds. There were no e-assist bikes back then. You either walked, sometimes you might have had a mule or a camel. But Jesus and his disciples walked everywhere they went. If I travel far enough back in my mind, I remember how many times I desire to be with my own earthly father. After all, he was my hero and my protector and my friend. I remember when late spring came and the fishing season began and I would just get so excited. I'd wait for dad to come home and I had already dug the worms that we needed. And uh, we'd get changed, we'd get cleaned up, we'd have supper. And just the two of us would go fishing for our favorite spot all by ourselves. I learned so much from my dad in those 13 years that I had with me. I only wish I could return to those days when it was just dad and me. He taught me so much. And I never doubted his love for me. 
God wants that same kind of relationship with us. His spirit calls us to this continual unity with him and to learn how much that he really does love us, how much he really wants to spend that time with us. Much like Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you, I knew you. God has called us because he's formed us. He knows us. He's called us to use our gifts when we are to use them. To lift that body of Christ up and to glorify him. Jesus was in complete unity and is in complete unity with the Trinity. He's in this loving relationship with his Father. That unity that's transcendent to us. He submitted to his father, was given the instruction necessary to live out the task that he was called to do, to bring the kingdom to the world, to take his work to the cross, and to pay the sin sacrifice once and for all. He connected away from the crowd with his father. Blaise Pascal once said, all of humanity's problems stems, stems from man's inability to sit quietly in a room all alone. And author David Mathis says, it's a sweeping claim, but it might just be the overstatement that we need today to be awakened from our relentless stream of distractions and diversions. How hauntingly true might it be that we are enabled to sit quietly. 400 years after Pascal, life may be as hurried and anxious as it has ever been. The competition for our attention is ruthless. We not only hear one distracting siren call after another, but an endless cacophony of voices that barrage us all at once. And yet long before Pascal, Jesus himself modeled for us the very kind of habits and rhythms of life that we need in any age. Even if as God in human flesh, he prioritized his time alone with his father. Imagine what good he might otherwise have done with all those hours. But he chose and chose again in perfect wisdom and love to give his first and best moments to seeking out his father's face and his will. And if Jesus, even Jesus, carved out such space in the demands of his human life, shouldn't we all the more do the same? Maria Boulding, Benedictine nun, once said, All your love, stretching out your hope, your thirst, God is creating in you so that he may fill you. God is on the inside of the longing. Prayer is a part of the rhythm of life, or what we as students say, this rule of life, or theologians call it a rule of life. When I took a course at ADC on spiritual formation, my professor, my friend, and my mentor asked us to read a book called Rhythms for Life by Alistair Stern. A very thought-provoking book, very interesting book that can be used to instruct us on our rhythm of life as we experience our journey in Jesus as a practical and helpful illustration to become more Christ-like. Here's an excerpt from the book. The Spirit assures our transformation, yet we do not become Christ-like by accident. We can't drift into it. It requires intentionality as we work out our salvation. Even though we are not handed a roadmap for this journey with Jesus, we can still create some guidelines to help us stay on course. Originating in the monastic tradition in the fifth century, the practice of living by a rule of life has sustained Christians throughout the ages. Essentially, in a rule of life, you identify habits and disciplines and practices to keep you moving toward Jesus with your community along with you. The Anglican tradition suggests that every Christian man and woman should from time to time frame for themselves a rule of life in accordance with the precepts of the gospel and the faith and the order 
of what we call church. I believe that outside our meeting together, this time alone with God is vital to begin discovering this rhythm of life. In that alone time, we can ask God to direct us daily, to bring forth our gifts that he's given us, to bring someone to our minds to pray for, to forgive our sins as we go to him and turn from them, and identify those things that come between us and him. After all, it's very easy in this distracting world. All you have to do is turn the TV on, and that can hold you for two hours. You look at your watch and you say, where did those two hours go? When we feel that we're not accomplishing much for him, or not praying enough, or meeting with him adequately, we just can't linger in that guilt, though. God's presence isn't contingent on our performance. We can seek out some new form of expression to worship him. Some practice to take up in our life that brings us closer to him. Every morning I spend time alone with God in prayer and I practice what's called the Lectio Divina. It's a contemplative way of reading the scripture. It's dated way back to the early Christian church. It was established as a monastic practice by Benedict in the sixth century. It's a way of praying the scriptures that leads us deeper into God's words. We slow down when we read it. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. We read a short passage more than once, over and over. We chew on it. We look over it carefully. We savor it. Scripture begins to speak to us in a new profound way. It speaks to us personally, and it aids that union we have with God through Christ, who is himself, the living word. When we spend time alone with God, we are regenerated like a battery. You think of that Duracell bunny. When a battery is depleted, it needs to be powered back up. We're much like that. This world can suck the life out of you. God uses his spirit to energize us so that we can promote his kingdom, work within our church body and in our communities. And when we spend time alone with God, we learn about our gifts and how to use them effectively. God calls us to live counterculturally, And to do that, we must spend time alone with him to learn from him. English mother of John and Charles Wesley, the Wesleyan movement, whose kitchen prayers were thought to be the seed of the Methodist movement. When Susanna Wesley was young, she promised the Lord that for every hour that she spent in entertainment, she would give to him in prayer and word. Taking care of the house, raising so many children, made this commitment almost nearly impossible to fulfill. She had no time for entertainment or long hours in prayer. She worked the garden, she milked the cow, she schooled her children, and she managed the entire household herself. So she decided to give the Lord two hours a day in prayer. Can you imagine this busy woman's life? She struggled to find a secret place to get away with him. So she advised her children that when they saw her with her apron over her head in the kitchen, that meant that she was alone with God in prayer. She could not be disturbed. She was so devoted to her walk with Christ. She prayed for her children and knowledge in the word, no matter how hard life was. In a similar way, as we draw near to the Lord, we ask him to shut out these many distractions and demands of life in order to focus our hearts and our minds entirely upon him. How do we effectively do this? How do we find this time alone with God? We've seen Jesus spending time alone with him. We've seen Susanna Wesley putting her apron over her head. What about today? Where in this busy world do we find this time alone with him? An old Quaker saying says, begin small and start promptly. We keep things simple, we begin soon. 
Simplicity begins with solitude, not mere time alone with him, but real time alone with God. Henry Nouwen once wrote, solitude begins with a time and a place for God and him alone. If we really believe not only that God exists, but that he is actively present in our lives, he's healing, he's teaching, he's guiding, we need to set aside a time and a space to give him our undivided attention. Where do we find this solitude? Where can we find this quiet place in the midst of this busy, crazy world? In a crowd, it's difficult to see God, Augustine once said. This vision craves secret retirement. Go into your room, Jesus said. Close the door. Pray to your Father who is unseen. There is a meeting place as close as our closet door, a time and a place where we can meet with God, hear his thoughts, he can hear ours. A time for the two of us when he can have our full attention and when we can have his. Solitude can be a healing place where God repairs the damage done by the noise of the world. The more you visit it, Thomas A. Kempis once said, the more you will want to return to it. I will awaken the dawn, David said in Psalm 57, 8. There is something to be said for meeting God before our busy days and schedules begin. But we must not understand this in some legalistic way to mean that we have to get up before the sun to merit this meeting with God. For many, morning is the most opportune time, but for others, there are times when it not only seems easier to meet with God, it's just easier at another time. But find that time. It's something you have to work out in your own mind and in your own body. The main thing is this eagerness to spend this time with him, to meet him. The advantage of doing so early is that we hear his thoughts before others invade our minds. The first step is to find a Bible, a quiet place, an uninterrupted period of time. Sit quietly and remind yourself that you're in the presence of the Lord Almighty. He is there with you, eager to meet with you. Stay in that quiet and secret place, A.W. Tozer once said, till the surrounding noises begin to fade out of your heart, till a sense of God's presence has enveloped you. Listen for his inward voice till you learn to recognize. When I was a teenager, there was a time when I just felt cut off from God. I was in a dark spot in my life. Will I graduate next year? Will I take, make my family proud of my accomplishments? But what if I fail? What if I stumble and fall? This dark cloud of this depressive thinking loomed over my head. But I was led to a particular scripture that helped me through this dark time. Psalm 91. I will read this psalm slowly. This could become your scripture promise as you spend time alone with him. Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. And I will trust him, for he will rescue you from every trap, protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes. See how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands. So you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. 
I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. So in your quiet time, rest on the promises of just this one scripture. There are many, 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 many more. Let him be your refuge and your strength. Let him cover you with his feathers. Feel the warmth of his loving arms wrap around you. Rest in that solitude. Make it your rhythm of life. Amen. Our next communion hymn is Let Us Break Bread Together. And then we will read our church covenant. 